uh, weekly press conference for the year and for the decade. So before we begin, if I don't get to see you, I want to wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. Uh, being our last press conference, I guess we're going to start just where we started with our first one about a year ago, uh, talking about impeachment. We watched what transformed last night on this floor. It's something that we said all the time. The weakest, the thinnest, the fastest impeachment in U.S. history. Schumer even admitted, trying to ask for more witnesses, that what happened on this floor over here was wrong. Now we have the own Speaker of the House who was so embarrassed, she admits the failure of his impeachment that she will not even send it to the Senate. <laughs> so embarrassed that I watched in her press conference, she wouldn't even take your question. That is not a good thing today. She's admitting defeat by not sending it. By refusing to send the impeachment over, she knows it's out of time. You know, the facts are not there. There's no basis for it. At the end of the day, the American public needs to be done. And with that, let me open it up for questions. Yes. Do you worry about your legacy defending a man who suggested last night that John Finger might be in hell? The half a 16 year old girl last week said she has anger management problems. Is it difficult to defend a man's The question to me is, am I worried about my legacy? No. Am I worried about my legacy of standing up for the Constitution? It's not, that it is not impeachable what the President did. The question before me as a member of Congress, is that impeachable? Even, which I would consider probably the most uh, respected constitutional scholar, someone who's not a Republican, a Democrat, Jonathan Turley even said, the only abuse that was moving forward was the Democrats. That there was no bribery, there was, there was no uh, obstruction. And that's the job that I have. Will I be embarrassed the fact that I just served for a year in Congress and the record of this Congress is more subpoenas than laws? I'm embarrassed that this is the Congress that did that. I'm embarrassed that this Congress promised to be different and they haven't. I'm embarrassed that this Congress designed their entire time from selecting of their committee chairs, from the freshmen on their first day, to Adam Schiff, with only one goal in impeaching the president. When they moved to that impeachment, going against everything and every fear that Alexander Hamilton had, that the animosities would be so great that they'd use their own political raw power to do something different, and they did it, and now they're so embarrassed that they wouldn't send it over to the Senate. Yeah, I'm embarrassed about that. You've had a record number of Republican retirements over the last, this Congress and the last, yes. including Mark Meadows today. What does that say to you about the health of your party? The health of our party is very strong. Let's talk about it. Last Congress, when we had retirements, I was sad about that. I wish we didn't have it. Uh, I wish Congress would have <laughs> not retired. I've never met a man named Dan Crenshaw before. His new, young, Navy SEAL who's now probably the strongest Republican on social media talking about policies and ideas. It's healthy. And for those who are afraid about Republican retirements, I would not be. If you take the average of the retirements based upon where if you look at the president's votes and others, it's an R23. A Republican's going to replace Mark Meadows. I wish Mark Meadows would say he's been a great mentor. But from the same point of when you look back, the thing about the Republican Party, we don't believe this should be your entire life. I watched Denny Hoyer, and he's a dear friend of mine, but he, he said in his speech the other day that he's been here 38 years. I don't think that's what our founders did, designed or thought of. And with the Republican Party, we're healthy. We bring new, new blood in. What's happening with a lot of retirements when you look across, and in 2010, I happened to be the recruitment chair. Remember, in 2010 is when Republicans defeated 63 Democratic Congress. If you measure us today of where we are as a party, of those who are running for office, we have more than 100 more than we had then. We have more women Republicans running for Congress than any time in the history of the Republican Party, from veterans and others. So we're stronger than you and I. And if you sit today, I, I, I watched uh, Speaker Pelosi said, what she had, she had a, a, a step in her, uh, her step. Swing in her step. But that may be true because her conference is going to be a little lighter and a little smaller. And the Republicans is going to be stronger after today. So, if you're asking about the party, you're asking about retirements, Republicans are going to replace. I think the question is, Speaker Pelosi, when she started this impeachment, she promised 
her own members that the public would be for. But we found that not to be the case. She promised that they'd be stronger, they're going to be smaller. We're the stronger conference after. I just don't find that any of this was healthy in any aspect that you made. It definitely is not healthy for our government, but it's definitely not healthy for America itself around the world. Yes? Two-part question. If you could respond to an earlier question about uh, can you defend Trump's remarks about uh, the late John Dingell. But my question uh, would be this week federal prosecutors uh, revealed that uh, Lev Karnas Giuliani's indicted associate received one uh, million dollars uh, came up during his bail hearing. Uh, as you know, some of Lev Karnas's money was sent to your committee. You donated it. Um, can you respond to both the development in the SDNY prosecution, uh, what that means for uh, now the linking of Dimitri Ophirtash, the oligarch, to uh, Parnas, and what that means for the investigation? I don't know. The investigation will continue to go for forward. Um, I thought you were going to refer to when you said what happened this week, I thought you were going to refer to the judge based upon what happened in the FISA court and the FBI spying on the campaign. That was a great concern to me as well. Uh, question to John Dingle. Uh, I'm, I knew John Dingle, I knew Debbie Dingle. I served with them both. I think they were very good individuals. Um, I think they served, the, John served his country very well, very proud. When John passed away, you watched on the floor and you heard my speech uh, on the floor uh, and contributed to uh, contribute to him, and uh, I find him a very strong individual, very bright individual. I think he made a great contribution to America. We may differ philosophically and sometimes in principle, but uh, no, I consider him a friend. Yes? Uh, now that the House has voted on articles of impeachment, what will House Republicans' role you know, in the Senate be? Are you planning on having some of your members prep the Senate? as they prepare for the eventual trial, or what will that look like? We, we will do anything um, senators do if they want information. They need, we have a lot of members that spend a lot of time on this. Um, but that's up to the Senate and also up to the President and who he wants to represent. But anything that we can be helpful with, we will. Yes, ma'am. Would you consider um, last night's House Republicans defeat uh, kind of a failure to the party? Mm -hmm. Defeat. Well, let me first gauge that. I would feel it was a defeat to the Constitution. That the rise of impeachment would become so low that you didn't read the Constitution to take it. I consider it a defeat in the idea that we didn't hold the same standard that the Speaker asked us to hold in March of this year, at least at that time. That impeachment was so divisive that it had to be overwhelming, compelling, and bipartisan. When I watched last night, the only bipartisan vote was against impeachment. A Democrat who's actually running for president voted president. So the question you probably wanted to ask was to the speaker. Unfortunately, she would not take any questions when it came to impeachment. I would think if Nancy Pelosi thought impeachment was so important that she had to put this before the American public, that she wrote a timeline, that she selected committee chairmen based upon in the future, that she spent two and a half years working on this, the press conference the day after impeachment that she has weekly, I thought she would have welcomed questions about impeachment. Unfortunately, she told you they were Republican talking points and she would not take your questions. I never thought a speaker would act that way. I guess the only thing I could take from that, she's embarrassed of it, she understands how weak it is, and she understands her own criteria was not met, constitutionally was not met. She probably failed on all parts. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. The USMCA set to pass today. The speaker uh, argued that Democrats deserve some credit for strengthening uh, the product over time, for improving the enforcement mechanisms. Uh, do you think that the final product that's going to pass is stronger than what was uh, what initially came out, uh, and how would you summarize the way that the negotiations have taken place over the last several months? Well, you, you started by saying the speaker believes the Democrats need some credit for bringing USMC up. 
at USMCA up. The only reason USMCA was brought up is because they impeached the president. So if she thinks the credit belongs for impeaching the president, is why she brought USMCA up, I'll let her have that credit. But the credit for the bill itself, no. What did she talk about? Less than 1% of the overall bill. I don't think it's better. It actually puts doubt into some people whether they would vote for it. USMCA talks about the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Mexico is our number one trade. Canada is number two. A lot of you have been reporting for the last year of our, our debate with China and trying to come to an agreement with China. China happens to be our number three trade. If you were going to go into a negotiation with China, you'd want to be the strongest possible ability, right? So would you think passing USMCA a year ago when the president came to that agreement would make us a little stronger with our negotiations with China? Yeah, everybody in the world does. But Nancy Pelosi had the power as speaker not to bring it up. Why? Because it didn't meet the timeline. She wrote a timeline of when she wanted to impeach the president in the last week that we are here. But she didn't want that to be the last vote. She had to have one other vote. So she held USMCA up, which only made our negotiations with China put us in a weaker position. So we got our first phase of agreement with China. We probably could have gotten it all if we were stronger with our first and second traders. So I don't know what credit she wants to take because she only harmed us by holding it. She wants to try to spin it in some manner. But if you're only negotiating 1% of the bill, you don't know how much credit you can take. America will be stronger because of USMCO. Presidents before have promised they would renegotiate this after 25 years. But only one president was able to accomplish it, President Trump. If you want to take, okay, let's look at the floor and let's see who should get the credit. Well, I took and I looked at every time the USMCA was brought up on the floor in the last year. You don't know what the percentages are? 91% of the time the USMCA was brought up to bring up to a bill and talked about was from the Republican side of the aisle. 9% from the Democrats. So I think history will tell who gets the credit. I'm just very proud of our members for never giving up for continuing to put pressure. But the greatest pressure that finally changed the Speaker's <clears throat> mind was the impeachment, because she did not want to go home with that being the final vote. She's so embarrassed by it, she won't even send the papers over. She's so embarrassed by that, she won't even take your questions. Why will she release the papers? I never thought I'd see a Speaker take that position. But I guess that's where we live today. I never thought we'd see a house doing the things that Alexander Hamilton feared the most. Yes? Have you spoken any more to uh, Congressman Jeff Van Drew about him moving over to the Republican Party? And how do you feel about, you know, welcoming a new member whose record doesn't exactly line up with Republicans? Republicans are a very big tent. Um, we're excited to have Jeff Randrew. We, we welcome anybody who believes this new Democrat Socialist Party has left them behind. If you want to say what's welcoming, why is he leaving the Democratic Party? There's many times in the past that members from either side of the aisle have left their party to go to the other. But I can't remember a time that somebody left from a majority party to join the minority party. So that question that you raised to me and the premise of it really should, should be asked to the Democrats. How can you be excited if you started this whole process thinking the outcome would be better and your own conference got smaller because of it? It showed the differences. It shows you're not ready. It also shows you cannot have a difference of opinion. When you watch the body language on the floor last night, you watch those 31 Democrats who sat in seats that President Kerry, their shoulders were down, their heads were down. They are not proud of what they were in. It was almost like the pressure was too great for them. They felt the pressure inside the chambers from their own conference greater than the pressure of the constituents back home of who they said they were listening to. 
They've watched it inside their town halls and others. Many of them promised before they even got here that they would not vote for Nancy Pelosi for speaker. They broke that promise right away. Because that promise of those two and a half years to impeach the president was too big. Many of them would say that they did not want to impeach the president. That's not why they came here. The chairman of the committee of impeachment, judiciary, was selected based upon that fact. The congressman they selected to represent the two articles of impeachment inside the rules committee two days before the president was inaugurated, said he was going to impeach the president. The freshmen who now pretty much control the floor for the Democratic side, who gave him the majority, on the day of being sworn in, a few hours later, said they wanted to impeach the mother. So, I guess that much of pressure outweighed to these 31s their own constituents. But the difference is, 11 months from now, the constituents will have a voice. For all the frustration I see, this is still the greatest form of government. Because the people have to vote. This impeachment vote yesterday was sandwiched in between two pretty bipartisan uh, major votes this week. The spending bill, uh, which had both bipartisan opposition and bipartisan support, and USMCA today. Uh, you know, the Democrats say that that shows that they, what they have said all along, that they can walk and chew gum at the same time, that they can hold the president accountable while also legislating. Uh, do you think that it shows that there can be some bipartisan cooperation despite all of what has been hanging over Congress over the last several months? There could be a lot of bipartisan support, but let's just take your question. We had bipartisan bills on the floor, a spending bill. When was a spending bill due? How many times did you have to do a continuing resolution before the pressure of Christmas coming, before the pressure of the troops not getting their pay raise? I don't think that's bipartisan. I think that's a failure in their job. Bipartisan. You, you become a new majority. You promise that you'll be different. They never passed the budget. <sighs> Bipartisanship. We started at the very beginning, concerned about prescription drugs. So we had three bills that would lower the price of drugs come out of energy and commerce with every Republican and every Democrat voting for it. But there was one person that had the power to change the bill, not in committee, but surely by herself, the Speaker. She changed the bill before it came to the floor to make sure it wasn't bipartisan, to make sure it could not become law. USMCA, you say, is going to be bipartisan. It will. We've waited one year for it to come to the floor. Why? Why would they put them all this week? It's interesting, we even used the word sandwich. Could it be they had a timeline? Could it be that they waited for the impeachment? Could it be that they could not have the votes for USMCA unless they promised to impeach the president? Could it be those who sit in the districts that President Trump carried that wanted USMCA had to pledge a vote for impeachment to get USMCA come? I don't know. That would be a question for the speaker, but I guess she doesn't take your questions on certain subjects. It's only the ones that she wants to talk about. It's interesting for an elected official to have that answer. Um, does the decision to not hand over the articles to the Senate right away, does that have any precedent, or does it raise any constitutional questions to you? I don't think she has the constitutionality to keep them. To me, it's about admitting guilt. But then again, she just makes the rules up as she goes. Remember, we did not use the standards that we used for President Nixon or Clinton. She changed all that. We did not use the standards that the Constitution tells us about impeachment. We changed it for that. We did not use the standards that the Speaker laid out to us in March. She changed it after that. It's an embarrassment. And I don't think the American public will sit back and take it. <coughs> Thank you for your time. I wish you all a very merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you.